I want to welcome you to the Hungry Hearts Ministries Service in Jackson, Tennessee. Evangelist Kelly McDonald says, the world headquarters of Hungry Hearts Ministries. Doesn't always seem like it when we're here. I want to apologize today for my uh, my slide dress. It's it turned real hot. We had real nice weather during Sukkot, and all of a sudden it's 100 degrees again. So uh, I want to thank you for watching the message. Hungry Hearts is a non-denominational church, which is Torah observant, spirit-filled with use of certain Hebrew worship tools like this to lead. Uh, we believe that Yeshua Messiah died to pay for our sins, and because he died to pay for our sins, we are now obligated to live by his laws and commandments. We're filled with God's Spirit. We worship him with it. We practice all the gifts of the Spirit, and today we're going to talk about how to have a good year because we just had one feast of Sukkot. I, I don't know where you are in, in your walk with the Lord, but if you didn't keep the Feast of Tabernacles with hungry hearts, you really missed out this year of all years we've done it. I know I say that every year, but this year was really, really beyond everything else. So what, what a great feast. Amen? Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but several people had tremendous encounters with the living, resurrected Yeshua Messiah, and it has changed their life in a permanent and irrevocable way, which is the goal of Hungry Hearts Ministries, all right? We, we aren't doing this just so you come and have a good time. We're doing this so that you have contact with the one and only living, resurrected Messiah, Yeshua, the one who actually died for you on the cross, the ones with the holes in his hands and his feet. We want you to have a contact with him. We want you to really know him, not just know about him, not just read about him. We want you to know him on a first-person basis, a first-name basis, and uh, we want you to have that kind of experience. So as we've taught many, many years, if you want to have a great feast in 2019, you start this week, right? Amen. It's, it's, right. it's all your process. So you want to have a great feast next year? Then you've got to start working at that great feast right now. And uh, look at your life. You know, we have a lot of a lot of young people like to play games. A lot, and, you know, when I was young, we played games, but I'm old. They were board games with dice, yeah. little pieces. I know that's foreign to some people, but that's the way we did it back in the day. I'm, I'm old. You know, we used to have Moses come over for barbecues, too. But, you know, it's been a little while, right? <laughs> Look at that. So if you look at your life from the perspective of a game, are you winning? Are you winning life? Either on a worldly perspective or a kingdom perspective, are you winning at life? Are the moves you're making in this game, are they paying off or are you just kind of slipping behind? Uh, we need to think about life from a kingdom perspective. Are we building the skills and the qualifications and the competencies and the the worship that is going to work for us in the kingdom of God. Are we showing Yeshua Messiah we're ready to go to work? He's building administration, guys. He's not just coming back to sit on a throne and, and play twiddly dumb, you know, or tiddlywinks. It's, a, it's, it's, it's going to be a world-ruling administration. And so if you look at the current administration, you can see the problems that uh, President Trump is having with holdovers from the past administration that don't want to implement his program. Yeshua's not dealing with that. Uh, you know, Donald Trump is the president, which means he has to go through Congress. He's got to go through bureaucracy. Yeshua Messiah is king. He doesn't have to go through anything. You're not working out. Boom, you're out of here. Next. Who, you know, I mean, it's immediate. So we're building those qualities and those skills to work with him and his administration. But he's, he's evaluating you as you go through life. This life is your qualifying. You know, I, I use the Daytona Beach 500 race in, in Corinth as a metaphor. You know, a lot of people have to run their cars all week long. Race is a week. It's not just what you see on Sunday. They're running cars every day, all day. Guys are trying to qualify. If your car's not fast enough, if your skills aren't good enough, you're, not, you're going home. Load your stuff up in the trailer and, and see it. You know, all week long, it's a big deal when somebody finally takes what they call the pole position. The best cars are put in the front of the race, and the worst cars are put in the back. So if you don't qualify, you're not put in the front, so you've got a, you got a fighting chance. Oh, you're put in the back. We didn't want to just get out of the way. Stay out of the way. Stay out of the way and let the real racers take the show. Oh, y'all will get that after a while. So this, is, this life that we're living is like Yeshua's qualifying. Come on. You're running all week. You're hoping to get into the race. I mean, you're, you're running the car. You're showing them, hey, I can do this. I can do this. Because when the kingdom starts, that's the race. Amen. Come on, you're qualified. Amen. So now during Teshuvah, we, we ask you to go through a four-week process. 
and uh, we got a little book here that we we use on to shoot with a season of repentance and in this book which is available for a really small fee on our website hungryheartsministry.com we talk to you about how to go through the the month before the feast of trumpets except this is a powerful program for your life all year long amen amen we ask you to repent in the first week, pray for your family the second, asking for Jabez appointments, and then asking for that life-changing God encounter. And all of this is detailed in this little book. So why not use that simple program for your life all year long? Amen? Amen. Why don't we look at it once a year when it actually is a year-long program of how to change and transform your life for the kingdom of God? God-fearing is what gets you in this race. Amen. And we've talked a lot about how we have to live by the tenets of a God-fearer, which basically, to make it real brief, is keeping Sabbath, keeping the holy days, tithing, and following the dietary laws. These are just the four simple basics of how to begin a Torah-observant life, living by those laws and commandments in the Bible. And we're going to always talk about that to some extent. But that only qualifies you to get on the track. That only qualifies you to get on the track and run. It does not qualify you to win the race. That's not enough. There's a whole lot more to this race than getting that. That's the foundation of it. You're not even getting in the show without that. Amen? Amen. And that's why we talk about it so much. Uh, the Teshuvah plan is the next phase or the booster phase of the Hungry Hearts Ministry program. The, Teshu the Teshuvah plan is the one that's going to really move your life forward. And one of the things we focus on is cleaning up your finance. So did we? Did we go through our finance? Did we get everything cleaned up? Did we make that asset uh, list? Did we make that list of debts? Did, do we have a net worth? You know, do we have a budget that works? Amen. I remember when I first started doing budgeting, it took me over 10 years to get a budget where my expenses were less than my income. It gets kind of frustrating. Amen. You start working on a budget, you can't ever make it work. But you finally get it below. But everybody needs to live below their income so that they have a small amount of savings. It's difficult to get there, amen? Because you see, the world has conditioned us to use money in the wrong way, and so we're outspending our resources, and then it doesn't work. So did we put together a budget that works? Did we really make that, that asset list? Did we, do we have actually have a net worth? You know, we ask you to look at it for Teshuvah, but really it's a plan for how to allocate your assets and your resources for the entire year. You have to stay in that. Same with the goal list. You know, we make goals for the year, but they're they're just on a piece of paper if you don't look at them. That's right. I mean, you know, I'll never forget, I, I read a book when I was a very young man who was saying to make a list of goals and then to look at it twice a day because we just forget. And I, for a long time, I just thought that was some magic formula. Oh, if I look at my goals twice a week, I'll do it. They'll happen, right? They'll just happen. No, if you look at them twice a day, maybe you'll actually get around to working on them. Hey, man, you know, the point is that we get up every day. It's like a whole new world. All memory erased, right? I slept so, since then, so it's done. Well, you know, we got to quit hitting the delete button when we go to bed. And we got we got to have, have our, our life with us so that we're doing stuff with it. Amen. I want to start Matthew 6. It's amazing what a cup of coffee will do for you when you wake up. No hallelujah, sir. I mean, come on, guys. That was like that was like an easy softball pitch, man. Y'all couldn't hit that? <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. He, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, we get all kind of wonderful spiritual things from this passage. And one thing that people take away from this is that uh, money is evil. Money's not evil. Saw so a great message by uh, Randy Caldwell. The only reason I didn't play it in here is because halfway through there's a glitch in the recording and the uh, the sound and the visual are off. So it's like watching a Japanese uh, Godzilla movie. So I didn't bring it in here. It's kind of distracting. But he gave a very great talk and he talks about how money is in earth. Money's in earth. It's either good nor evil. It's the intent of your heart when it's in your hand. So that's why I asked the question, is it filthy lucre or a much needed blessing? Well, that depends on you entirely. It can be a very much needed. Just try, try going without it. Let, come on. Let, let, let JEA cut the power off one time. We'll see how much of a much needed blessing it is. Right. <laughs> it gets real much needed, right? But what I wanted you to talk, think about was 
this the shot level of interpretation, and that is we have to learn how to use unrighteous mammon. We have to learn how to use unrighteous mammon. You know, we, we talk about Jesus is Jewish. Right. You used to meet the basement of a Jewish temple. Those people are phenomenal. They're generous. They're kind. They're giving. Uh, they do anything for you. But one thing I noticed running from them for 30 years is that they do not do stupid things with money. They just don't do stupid things with money. They're generous. If you're in help, they will help you. But they're not going to do stupid things with money. And I think it's because they've learned the hard way what happens when you do stupid things with money. But that's that's the rub. See, they learned, and most of us don't. We just keep repeating the same old things that got us in the mess we're in and thinking more of it's going to get us out, but more of it's not going to get us out. Uh, it's just going to re- perpetuate the problem. We have to learn how to use unrighteous mammon. We have to learn how to use our precious resources for the kingdom of God. Look, if we're going to be in charge of cities, counties, municipalities, towns, states, you can't handle money. Isn't that the problem we have with politicians now? They've taken our tax money and blown it on stupid junk. And then we're like, why don't you fix the roads when we're out of money? Well, I gave you all that tax money. What do you mean you're out of money? I mean, we, we fixed a, a particular road over here in Jackson. We were all in stunned shock. The road had been bad so long. Some of those potholes were like driving down into cow wallers. Over on that 40. See, now, Miss Francis knew exactly what I meant by that. See, our, our, our people from up north did not understand that a bit. I just short circuited all their brains over there, right? Now, you know what a cow waller is. I use that term correctly. Just because I'm fluent in more than one language. <laughs> that's it, that's it. So, if we can't put our resources to work for ourselves, then how are we going to put our kingdom or for the kingdom? Resources for the kingdom. Let's go to uh, Luke chapter 16. You know, if, if your television cable provider doesn't give you worship vision, you need to call and ask for it. Because you missed some really good worship up in here today. <laughs> Luke 16, verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of life. See, they know how to handle money many times. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. See, that's why that's why God gives you a certain amount of money. He's seeing if you're trustworthy with it. Can you handle what you have? If you want more money from Jesus, you have to show him you can handle what money you have. Amen? And until you can handle what money you have, you can bet your, your whole life he's not going to give you any more money than that. You know, when our children were small, and Anise used to put them on a blanket. They couldn't leave the blanket until they could learn how to behave in the blanket. Then she would increase it. Right? Well, the Lord's doing the same thing with us. He gives us territory, and we have to learn how to behave in that territory before he expands it. So people say, oh, pastor, I need to be blessed. Okay? Start handling what you got, and then he'll bless you. Amen? Yeah. you got to be trustworthy in little. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who's going to trust you with true riches? Hmm. Hmm. This is why money management is so important. Now, look, I, I know I can put everybody to sleep with this. Lanice, Lanice, it, it took 30 seconds and she was off to the bathroom in Corinth because talking about money, she just can't deal. And I know a lot of folks are like that. They don't want to talk about money. It just drives them nuts. But I'm just here to tell you, if you can't handle money, the Lord's not going to let you handle much of anything else. Amen? So I don't know what your budget is. I don't know what your assets are. I don't know what your debts are. You better learn to get it squared away and handle it properly because you're not getting any more until you learn how to handle what you have. Amen? So those TV preachers can tell, tell you to send them money and God's going to pay your bills. I'm just here to tell you, Jewish Jesus is not going to do that. Amen. Amen. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> and if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who's going to give you property of your own? You see, here we're looking at this like our own little house, right? My little apartment, or maybe I'm going to get a little farm somewhere. That's not what he's talking about. When he's talking about property, he's talking about fiefdoms. He's talking about rulership in the kingdom of God. So when you come to property of your own, he's not talking your little house or your little farm. He's talking about where you're going to rule. Are you capable of ruling us? Well, we're in Manasseh, right? Amen. We're in Manasseh, tribe of Manasseh. So Manasseh has a will have a apostle, one of 
of the 12 apostles will be over Manasseh. Okay. Are we qualified to govern a region? All right, we're going to change mics. So are you qualified to govern a region? Are you qualified to govern a state? I mean, America's divided into 50 states, amen. I don't know how Jesus will do it, but he might do it that way. Tennessee's divided into three grand divisions, east, middle, and west. Are you up to handling one of those three divisions? These are broken down into counties. Are you up to handling a county? Can you be county mayor? Can you be city of Jackson mayor? It's a lot more difficult. I know it's easy to point at our, our goofy politicians and point out their flaws, but it's a lot more difficult to do than it looks like. But let me tell you something. There's not going to be elections in the kingdom of God. Jesus appoints you, and if you can't do the job, you're out of here, and he puts somebody else in. So the point is, can you handle your business in a level that's going to make him go, oh, you can handle you can handle a state? Sure you can. Oh, but Lord, I've, I've only handled my little, my little tiny budget. Yeah, but you were good at it. Yeah. Right? That's right. So we have to look at everything we do from a kingdom perspective to qualify for ruling in the kingdom of God with him. See, you couldn't get in the kingdom of God. It took his death to get you in there. That's right. But this is a different ballgame. We're not talking about in the kingdom of God. We're talking about what you're going to do in the kingdom of God. It's up to you to use the Holy Ghost and the skills and the life experience to build the qualifications to be able to do something in the kingdom. Amen? All right. That was a mouthful of it. Many teachers teach wrongly and they gain big followings by teaching people to send them money and God's going to bless you. Hmm. <laughs> Jewish Jesus isn't going to do that. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's not the way it's going to happen. He told us to husband your money carefully, not throw it away at somebody. You know, Bernie Madoff went around asking for money. I'm going to give you a big return. Give me money. I'm going to give you. He went to jail for that. Amen. And there's a lot of televangelists that probably need to be cellmates. I said it out loud. Jesus has a system. He's got a system of giving. I mean, Evangelist Kelly's been going through the whole thing on the way. There's a system in that way. There's a system of how you're to give. And I'm telling you, if you'll follow it, it will work for you. Amen? The first thing is tithing. A tenth of your increase. Bring it into church. It comes in here. So when you put your, your money in the basket in the Hungry Hearts Church envelope, it goes into Jackson account. And it pays for everything in Jackson. And then, just like it says in the law, we take 10% of that and give it to the ministry. Because back in the day, if you gave 10%, your 10% tied to your local Levite, he sent 10% to Jerusalem. So that's how we do that. We follow that system. The other part of tithing is you save up 10% of your income to go to the Holy Days. Now, for those of you that had 10% to go to the feast, it was really cool, wasn't it? Oh, <laughs> For those of you that didn't, you're like, man, if I had 10%, it would have been so much better, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got to follow God's system. Because if you're not, you're not tithing. So we talked about the storehouse of heaven. You want it open, right? Yeah. Well, it's not just the 10% you put in that bucket. It's also the 10% you save up for the holy days. Because if you're not doing both of them, you're not doing either of them. Oh, pastor, you had to go there. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I had to go there. You want to be blessed, right? Yeah. What's the point of telling you to only go halfway and you're not going to get blessed? That's right. Come on. I would be negligent in my duties. I have to take a knee in front of Jesus and, and, and the beating behind the woodshed that goes with it. I don't want to go behind the woodshed with Jesus. Are you kidding? That's not what I want. No, I'm going to tell you straight. You can be mad. I don't want to take a knee over it. Amen? Now, the next thing is the Holy Day offer. You're commanded to bring an offering on the holy days. Now, in, in Exodus, it says three times a year. In Leviticus, it says seven times a year. So that's your choice. That's your choice. I was thinking about this during the feast. And I, I personally divide mine up. We don't take up an offering on atonement because you didn't bring your own sacrifice on atonement. Amen? One was made for the whole nation. You didn't bring your, you didn't bring your little animal on atonement. You brought him every other holy day. You brought your little animal. You didn't do it on atonement. So all the other holy days I, I, I give an offering. And let me tell you why I split mine up. <clears throat> You're seeding something into each day that's different. If you only give one for the spring holy days, then whatever day you put it on, that's where you seeded it. If you only bring one for the fall holy days, then whatever holy day you gave it on, you seeded it. But I want to seed into trumpets. I want to seed into Sukkot. I want to seed into the last great day. Amen. There's something there for me. I want to seed into each one of them. Come on, that was good. That was a good revelation yesterday. Come on. Come on. 
Then there are fellowship offerings. And that is what we are collecting your money to send to India and Kenya for the Holy Days. Now, Brother Lim was wanting me to take up a monetary offering during tabs. But I can't do it during tabs. It's too late. They need that money before tab starts. That's why I ask you for that offering money in advance. And so I need to get that money to him no no, no before atonement. I mean, after atonement's too late. He needs that money. As a matter of fact, Joe Spat was fussing at me because uh, a lot of people were booking in the hostel. And there they have to pay in advance. And so they couldn't book in the hostel until we sent the money. So they could even come to the feast. <clears throat> so everything's different over there, and I gotta get so I gotta get them their money in advance. So we can't wait to take it up during tabs. We gotta do it before tabs. And that's why you hear us ask about that. And then the last one, and I'm using NIV terms, the last one is a peace offering. That's an offering you give after you've done everything else and you decide, you know what? Me and the Lord are tight. I'm gonna give him something else. But you gotta have it to give, right? I mean, don't don't give him the rent money and hope he's gonna make it back up. That's not how it works. <laughs> Y'all don't get that. Yeah. So you got your rent money, and you say, I'm going to give a peace offering. Okay, well, you better have a way to come up with the rent other than that, because he's not obligated to make due for that rent money because you gave it to him, right? Yeah. Just because you gave him the rent money doesn't mean he's got to replace it. Mm -hmm. Y'all get that after a while. Well, maybe after the second time you do it. <laughs> but then the television preachers tell you to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you got your rent money. Send it on into my ministry right now, and the Lord's going to pay your rent the rest of the year. And I don't, they are. It doesn't work, does it? It doesn't work. I see God's not behind it. So when you're putting God on the spot, he has a tendency to say, oh, really? Well, just how you going to do that? Yeah, I, I want to see. How you going to do that? They sent you the rent money, home dog. Now, how you, how you going to get them that rent money? Let's see. Right? Because the Lord don't play. Amen? Uh, Deuteronomy 14. Deuteronomy 14. Verse 22, talking about second tithe. It says, Be sure to set aside of the tenth of all your fields produced each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and oil, the firstborn of your herds and flocks, in the presence of the Lord your God, at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. And that Hebrew word there for revere means fear, revere, or worship. So it can be the fear, you've got to keep the commandments. It can be revere, the proper awe and respect, or it can be worship, right? He's saying all three. You get all three of these when you go keep the holy days. Well, that's a great reason to keep the holy days, right? You get all three of these. This understanding that transcends life is, is important, right? Yeah. But if the place is too distant and you've been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe, just imagine some of these cattle ranchers coming out of Montana, driving a herd of cattle. How are you going to get across the Mississippi? All the bridges are interstate. <laughs> then turn it into silver. So they didn't have coinage back in the day. They just weighed the, weighed the silver out. You know, when Abraham bought the cave of Machpelah, he weighed the silver out. What was that guy's name, the Hittite? Was it Elon? I keep thinking that's wrong. I, keep... I think it may be Elon now. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, he just weighed silver out. They didn't have coins for later. Now, the shekel was a weight. And later it became a coin of the same weight. So the shekel was a coin struck that was a shekel's worth of silver. Amen. So you carry the silver with you to Jerusalem. Now look what you do with it. Then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver and go to the place the Lord your God will choose and use the silver to buy whatever you like. Buy what you like. What is it going to take to make you happy? See, that's the whole thing. You go to Deuteronomy 16, he's talking about you've got to celebrate the feast with great joy. And so he's telling you, take your tithe and buy what makes you happy. I didn't get a hallelujah to you ladies. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. Are y'all dead today? I mean, Ephron. Ephron, okay. Ephron. So, Ephron. Yeah, so, you know, what's wrong with you ladies? I mean, I, I just told you to take your tithe and go to tabs and buy what you like. And I didn't get a shout or nothing out of y'all. Man, I talk about $2 shoes from Coles. I get a rise in Murfreesboro. Man, them girls come to life. They over there half sleeping, eyes all glazed out over there. And all of a sudden, whoo, $2 shoes from Coles, man. I mean, they're about to go now. And I'm telling y'all to take your tithe and go buy what makes you happy. Y'all just sitting there. I 
don't know about y'all. But let's see. I'll, it's just the least in the shout. I know she doesn't need any time money next year. <laughs> no shout, man. That's a, well, this, I'll buy my homework this time. So, cattle, I don't know. It's time to have some beef barbecue. Sheep, lamb, it's time for some euros. Uh, wine, uh, this other fermented drink here should be strong drink. You know, they, they made some beer from the pyramids and it was stronger than Colt 45. I mean, it does not get out stuff. Or anything you wish. Clean water. Miss Francis just wants clean water. <laughs> yeah, but I got to have your lemons and, and uh, uh, lime slices in there. Yeah. Anything you wish. You're supposed to go and be happy. So, praise God, someone's there in Jerusalem to sell you stuff, right? Because when you get down there, I'll get that in a minute. What are you going to do with a whole cow in your sukkah? <laughs> you're not going to do anything with a whole cow in your sukkah. I can tell you right now, you're not going to do anything with a whole cow. It is too hot in Jerusalem to light a fire in that thing. Besides, you'll burn it down. Y'all get that after a while. You get a big old cow in there on a spit in your sukkah, you're going to burn that sucker to the ground. It might burn down half of Jerusalem while you're at it. So you're going to have to buy food already prepared from somebody that prepared it. That's why it's okay to go out and eat all the restaurants because... That's what they had to do. You weren't going down there with cornmeal. You got nowhere to bake anything. You're not, I mean, you're in a sukkah for eight days. You're going to have to buy prepared food from somebody. Praise God they were there to do it. Amen. He said, then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord. That's why the fellowship meal on holy days is so important. And so we want to make sure that we go to a nice enough restaurant, but not too nice. It needs to be nice enough so that, that brothers with enough money can have a, a, a better meal, but it needs to be not so nice that the brothers that don't have enough money can still go and buy something on the right. It needs to be that middling place where everybody can go because it's so important we eat together. I cannot emphasize on a holy day how important it is that we all eat together. Don't have to be at the same table because the waiters can't seem to handle it when we're all at the same table. But if we're at... Actually, it's easy. Tables of four to six are the best because everybody can get up and walk around. When, when you're on that long table on, against the wall, you can't get out of there. You're stuck, man. You're stuck. You're not going nowhere. You pull a bob at the end of the table, right? <laughs> That's all you can really do because uh, you're stuck. You can't get out. But if we're in small tables and we can all get around, mingle around, talk to everybody, and everybody can have a good time. This is so important. And then do not neglect the Levites living in your towns that have no allotment. This is second tithe. This is what you do at the feast. This is how we keep feast days. Now, below this, these last two verses, I'm not going to read them. This is third tithe. This is third tithe. They're like, oh, third tithe. I remember they told me about third tithe. I had the same response y'all just did. How many of you are there? <laughs> <laughs> the third tithe was only done in the third and the six years of a seven-year cycle. It wasn't done every year, and it was used to support the indigent and the widows and the orphans. And so when you're on Social Security, that's why we tell you not to tithe it, because Social Security is the American equivalent of third tithe. Let me tell you how much better God's system is than the one you're in. God's system is 10% every third and six year out of seven, which equates to 2.9% on an annualized basis. Social Security tax is 7.65%, and you probably only get about a third of it back. And they had the money for 40 years, so it could have grown into a fortune, but they were stupid with the money, and they spent the money. So I'm going to call out some people, right? So they told us all this time it was in a lockbox. And it, it wasn't in a lockbox. And so uh, kudos to Ross Perot for calling them out. They didn't even buy marketable treasury notes with it so we could sell them to the Chinese and pay our benefits. We have worthless IOUs that we owe ourselves. That's why the, the, the debt debate you're here talking about, debt held by the public versus total debt because the Social Security part of the debt is bogus and we know we're not going to pay it back to ourselves and we're just going to default on our Social Security. Uh -huh. Two years after I dropped. Mm. Isn't that special? Mm -hmm. And Al Gore was talking about that stinking lockbox in his debate with uh, George W. Bush the whole time knowing it's a fraud. There ain't no lockbox. There ain't never been a lockbox. They blew the money and it's gone. Yeah. The only person that was even willing to talk about it was uh, the governor of New Jersey. What's his name? 
Chris, yeah, Chris Christie. He's the only one that said it's gone. I'm sorry, the money's gone. I hate to tell you, we got to find some other way to do it. And you're gonna, we're gonna cut your benefits. Okay, well, I got news for everybody. President notwithstanding, they're gonna cut our benefits. It's already on your statement. You get your social security statement, you drop down to the fine print, it says we're only gonna pay you 73 cents on a dollar. So when they tell you you're only gonna get a thousand dollars for your social security, you're not gonna get a thousand dollars, you're gonna get seven hundred and thirty dollars out of it, and they're gonna take a buck and a half out of that for Medicare. So you're looking at five hundred bucks. What are you gonna do with five hundred bucks? You're not gonna do a doggone thing with five hundred bucks, because in 10, 15 years that five hundred bucks is gonna be as worthless. That's two hundred bucks is now. So what are you gonna do with that? It's gonna be chump change when you get it. So you're going to keep on working. So you're going to keep on working. How did Ms. Francis put it? Well, Pastor Bill, you're going to get you some of that there harsh liniment. That's what you're going to do. You're going to get you some harsh liniment, and you're going to keep right on working. <laughs> the sad part is she's right. <laughs> God's way is better, amen. And if we followed his system, we wouldn't be in this mess to start with. Now, shifting gears, we have to live in repentance. The first thing we teach you at, at, at Teshi Bai is to repent. Repent for your yes. sins. Yes. And you need to live in that. Now, I know we're going to make the list and burn it twice a year, but you got to do this daily. you got to do this weekly. From time to time, look, the Lord knows you did it. You know the Lord knows you did it. Just come clean. I mean, you like talking to Jesus on a daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. Lord, about that junk I did yesterday. Yeah. Lord, about that stuff I said in traffic on the way home. <laughs> we all have our own little thing, and we just have to give it up, right? Like it wasn't bad. I didn't even. I didn't even lose a victory. <laughs> She's laughing at me. First Peter chapter three. No, so I almost lost a victory yesterday. <laughs> Dude came out of the side road and through massive traffic in both lanes went right across. <laughs> In a pickup truck, no less. And then today we were coming up here. We're in downtown Jackson. You know where the barrel is at the bottom of downtown. Mm -hmm. This person pulls. I, I, I'm I'm beside the double yellows in the left lane going north, and this person pulls up beside of me in the oncoming turn lane and stayed there. I didn't get out. I mean, it's crazy here. All right, First Peter three verse fifteen. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. Do this with gentleness and respect. So we must actively take ground for the kingdom of God, and that means you need to have materials with you. Amen. Amen. Uh, a great thing to have had this week is our trifold on the Lord's Feast, written by Evangelist Kelly McDonald, because everybody's asked you, where were you? Yeah. Where were you? What do you mean you went to church for eight days? You went to church twice a day for What is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. Have those tripoles, right? Have those tripoles, right? Now, the reason we do it that way is because a lot of people are just harassing you and don't care. And it only costs eight cents, right? And some of those people, and you can't qualify because you don't know. So, so someone can be really smart I like to you and end up in church in two weeks. You just you can't pre-qualify. So you give everybody the trifold. It's eight cents, we don't care, right? Eight cents, sense, we don't care. If you get a live contact and you can get them a book, that's like a buck and a half. Hey, a little investment. <laughs> if they really get good and they come in and start tithing, then, then we can worry about one of these. But first, we want we want to pre-qualify everybody and make sure that they have a real interest. Amen? So can you give an answer? So you had all these Jabez appointments this week. Where were you? Oh, what do you mean you were at church? You were at church. How do you go to church twice a day for eight days? Aren't you sick of church? Those are Jabez appointments. They were sent to you by God so you could witness. Well, come on, somebody. So can you give an answer? Do you carry materials? 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. Have you studied our doctrines well enough to give an answer that makes sense to somebody else? Hmm. See, these doctrines are not just something we made up. We didn't just sit around one day on a Sabbath afternoon and decide, you know what, we'll just put that in there. And Well, how about this over here? And Hey, I've always wanted to talk about that, and we didn't do that. These doctrines were handed down to us by the best of the best of the best of the Church of God, 
and we have kept them. And Evangelist Kelly can tell you, as he's been around with the BSA, he can tell you we've kept them better than anybody else. And I was told when we became spirit-filled that we would not keep these doctrines by virtue of being spirit-filled, and we've done the best job. And I'll say that to anybody. We have done a great job. And it has not been easy. It's not an easy thing to do. We've had hundreds of people come in here and want to change the doctrines. Well, Pastor Bill, do we have to be this hard on this point? Well, it's Bible, so I guess we do. Well, Pastor Bill, I want this other point instead. And it's just been continuous. But we've held. So you look at our leadership team. We have held these doctrines for you, and we're passing on to you. But you've got to do your due diligence. You've got to take the books and the booklets and study them through and study them through the Word. Every one of these books, uh, you need to study every one of them all the way through the Bible over and over again. Don't just go through it one time and expect, oh, I got the answer one time. We didn't write that in one time. No. Amen. <laughs> well, we did, but those, those didn't go up there in one time. Those are months of work for every one of them. So I don't expect that if we could take, have to take months to write it that you're going to get it in one reading. It's going to take some study. You've got to spend some time in the Word. What we've done is we've taken Bible and pre-digested it to make it easier for you instead of having to put all this together on your own from this book. Amen? And that was a great place to shout. Jude chapter Amen. 3. Jude verse 3. That was some work. Verse 3, dear friends, although I was very eager to write you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. We have carefully passed on to you that ancient Christian faith from the original apostles after it had been squelched down and then re-expanded out. People gave me a real hard time last year because I would not disavow Herbert W. Armstrong. And I won't. I will not disavow Herbert W. Armstrong. How can you disavow the leader of your movement and expect to be a part of that movement? Mr. Armstrong has not done anything, to my knowledge, that warrants that kind of treatment. I, but I'll tell you what it is. It was a pre-play of what you see going on right now with Judge Kavanaugh. We're going to charge him guilty because we brought charges. He, he can't. We can't use him anymore. Excuse me? We have almost a thousand years of English common law from the Magna Carta that says a man is innocent until proven guilty and has to be judged guilty by a jury of his peers. We don't have any of that. Then I guess it's not, it's not okay to just do that, is it? I, I, I'm not giving up my common law rights that go back a thousand years because people don't know how to behave. Either with Mr. Armstrong or Judge Kavanaugh. Now, if there's evidence to the contrary, then it needs to be examined. I grant you that part. But without any evidence, there's nothing to examine. I've watched five prosecutors and four judges on TV talking about the evidence say that this would not even get a police car to show up at your house. You call up and get and say, well, so-and-so did this to me. Well, well, where are you? I don't know. When did it happen? I don't know. Did you get there? I don't know. How'd you get home? I don't know. That's a prank call. No one's going to come out to your house and talk to you about that. If you go down to the police station with that kind of complaint, they're not going. To, they might humor you for a little bit, but nothing's going to come of this. No investigators following this up. There's no call. I watched a judge say, who was a former prosecutor, that he has to tell as, as a prosecutor, it is his legal requirement to tell the accused when they were supposed to have done it and where they were supposed to have done it. And without those two pieces of information, nothing's happening. So I'm not going to disavow Mr. Armstrong because of things that didn't happen. He was perfectly politically correct in the 70s when he wrote what he wrote, and that's not politically correct now. Okay, so I'm not politically correct now, nor do I intend to be. I was born in West Tennessee. I have a license to call it as it is. And I'm good. And I'm never going to be politically correct. I said, I don't do that to hurt people's feelings. But you know, we've lost sight of reality. We have every five years, we have to reframe all the terms differently so that no one can talk to each other. It's like we're creating our own Tower of Babel in our language now. That's not a reason to get rid of Mr. Armstrong. 
Mr. Armstrong was used by God Almighty himself to restore 15 to 20 truths to the church that had not been there since the early church. Let's start with the holy days, right? A lot of folks don't realize that. Before Herbert W. Armstrong, there wasn't anybody keeping holy days in the United States. The Sabbath churches only kept the Sabbath. Oh, wow, really? Some of them didn't keep the dietary laws. Oh, really? And we could go on. You can't get fired from your job and not pay the Holy Spirit. We came into the church just about the time evangelist Ralph Helge won the court case at the Supreme Court that says your employer cannot fire you for keeping all eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, we're gun shy about using that. But the Muslims are using it to take off to go to the Hajj. So, so they use our court case for their religion, and we won't use our court case to go to Sukkot. What? That's goofy. That's goofy. What? If your employer has more than 15 employees, they have to give you off. And if they don't, you can sue for money damages. And we had a couple that was fired over not wanting to drive a truck on the Sabbath, and they won a large settlement. Amen? They cannot fire you for this stuff. It's reasonable accommodation to let you go. Second Timothy 3. So, <clears throat> I've been very careful. Kelly's been very careful with me to, to research and, and back it all up to give you the pure truth of God without contamination. Amen? This is really important. Now, we're going to take this into a much more important level, and I'm basically setting up a foundation for you that what you can believe in our doctrines is sound and solid and true. You can have trust and confidence in it. Why? So we can have the God encounters we want, because that's the that's where we're headed with this, is God encounters at the end. But if you are not walking in Torah, you're not going to have them. Amen? You can tell me all the stuff you want to. If you're not living right, you're just not going to experience the true and living God. If you live right, you can get there. But it takes more than that. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. What I'm telling you, I learned from spiritual giants. Brother Mac is going behind and he is going to first century source documents to confirm it in history. Pretty cool, huh? You don't get that in the average church. So the, the things that were spoken to me, I passed down to you carefully and intact. And Brother Mac is getting in there and backing it up with solid historical fact, okay? And they're in agreement. To this, to, this, to this point, I don't know of anything that's out of agreement. I've carefully passed it down. Now, I just want you to know, these men spoke the very words of God. Now, back in the day, when you came to the minister man and for counsel, and he gave you counsel, you followed it. You didn't say, well, you know, Pastor Bill thinks I need to do this, but I, I'm not feeling it. I'm going to go ahead and do whatever. You didn't do it that way back in the day. When you came to the minister, man, he told you what to do. You did it exactly that way. You know why? Because when you didn't, your whole life blew up. Back in the day, when the minister man told you, you got to do thus and such, and you decided you were going to play mule, you got, you got your head beat off. I don't mean by people. I mean by your life blowing up all around you. I'll give you a good one. I was in financial crisis back in 89. The minister man told me, and I'm going to quote it, and I know this is totally not politically correct now, but it was kind of borderline then even. He said, son, you need to get a second job. I mean work. You know the stuff Mexicans do? I know it's totally incorrect, and I'm not trying to be offensive to my Mexican brothers. But he was trying to get a point to me because I had a sec my second job was another sales job. For the life of me, I could not see how a $3.50 an hour job was going to give me enough money to plug that hole because after I paid taxes and tithes on it, it wasn't even half of what I needed. So we went through financial hell. Finally, running to Tennessee to take refuge because we couldn't deal with Florida anymore. It's too expensive. Then I lose my job and I get a job at the rest area for five bucks an hour. And I'm doing what the minister man said work, actual work, work. And then all of a sudden it fit. But it wasn't enough money to fit. See, back in the day, you did what they said. Or you, you messed around until you fell into what they said. Because it wasn't going to work out until you did what they said. Amen. Y'all get that after a while. Somebody be 
I'm gonna be back in the house tomorrow. And go, oh, that's what he meant. Okay. First Timothy chapter four. It has been really hard to hold this. It is not easy to to keep this doctrinal set intact. Uh, lots of people now are bailing out on one point or another, and uh, lots of people now are doing away with the rescue of the saints. I don't know why they want to get rid of it. We used to call it the place of safety back in the day. If you want proof for that, we have it. It's on the website. Come away with me. But a lot of people are getting rid of that right now. And I'm not sure why they want to get rid of that, frankly. Right? Why that was one of the better doctrines we had. So it's, it's been hard to hold this. It's a real battle to keep all this strong. Amen? Verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things caught by demons. Okay, so there's a lot of spirits working out there. And so there's only one spirit, but there's a lot of spirits. And so you have to be careful when you're online, trolling around, getting with people that aren't sound and stable because they're, they're going to tell you stuff that's going to mess you up. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars. They don't live what they teach. They teach you well enough, but they don't do it themselves. Whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. So they've broken the commandments enough times, they don't think they have to keep them. They forbid people to marry. There's a whole church that does that, amen? Forbid to marry? And order them to abstain from foods which God created to be received with, for, with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything, that word is Roma, correct? Yeah, is that Kelly Mack's book? Clean and unclean? The Greek word there that's translated everything in the NIV means things that are clean to eat in Leviticus chapter 11. So everything in Leviticus chapter 11, God created, is good. And none of the things in Leviticus 11 are to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Not whatever you want to put in your mouth. Just the things God said were food. Oh, well, that changes everything, doesn't it? But then they tell you not to eat things that God said were okay to eat. Like no meat on Friday. That's nuts. It's the best day to get your barbecue. <laughs> Beef, that is. Because it is consecrated by the Word of God. See, if it's going to be consecrated by the Word of God, it's got to be legitimate in Leviticus 11. Or it's not consecrated by the Word of God. Free book. On, well, not free, but small small donation on the website, HungryHeartsMinistryWithAY.com. Look for this book, Clean and Unclean. It's our bestseller by far. If you point these things out to the brothers, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Let me, let me put that in modern 21st English. Get off the internet. Quit following every wind of doctrine you get on the internet. Most of it's unsubstantiated. Some of it's just downright wrong. A very famous internet teacher was out about two weeks ago saying that he has uncovered from archaeological evidence the exact pronunciation of the sacred name of God. So we watched for a little bit, and then he says what it is. And it was so bogus, I couldn't believe he actually said it out of his mouth out loud on TV. He said that the sacred name is Jehovah. But in order for that to be correct, there has to be two bobs or a vet in the sacred name. And there's not two bobs. So if the first bob is a bob O, then where's the second bob? Can't get that from here. Amen. Wow. <laughs> it's bogus as it gets, right? I mean, just on the face of it. So they have all these doctored documents. They're supposedly dug up from antiquity with that bob, that bow marker over the top of that bob. When let me explain something to you. Many, 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 many years ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I was told that the big difference between Israeli Jews and American Jews is that Israeli Jews don't need the bow markers. They didn't have bow markers in the day because they didn't need bow markers. So why are you going to dig up something from 3,000, 4,000 years ago with valve markers in it when they didn't use valve markers until only a few hundred years ago? Oh, well, so much for that great. <laughs> That's what I mean about godless myths and old wives' tales. Stay off the internet, man. This, this, unless you're, till you're grounded in the faith and can sort out the trash from the real, don't, don't even be on there. We have a great system of literature. We've got we've got. Uh, many, many, many dozens of albums of great sound, bright teaching. Why, why waste your time on the internet looking at junk when you're at Hungry Hearts and you've got all the real stuff here? 
Amen? Train yourselves to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things holy, promise for both the present life and the life to come, the kingdom of God. This is a trustworthy saying and deserves full acceptance that we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Command and teach these things. Titus chapter 1. Verse 14. Pay no attention to Jewish myths or the commands of those who reject the truth. Jewish myths. So people want to pick up all these things that are supposedly Jewish, and they're not. You go to any Jewish temple, you find out it's all bogus, it's all made up. They've got some extreme weird sect of craziness, and they're following it. It's like, oh, we got to do this. My favorite is head coverings. Right? Oh, the women got to have a head covering on. Why? Is that in the Word? I didn't see that in the Word. I believe Brother Mack was the first one to point out that that passage in the Bible, he's being, Paul is being facetious with them. I don't have a lot of that. 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Paul's talking about head coverings. And so he's being facetious. He's facetiously mocking these Corinthians. What, did the word of God originate with you? This is Greek. This is not This is not Jerusalem. You're in Greece already, man. I mean, you, this didn't originate with you. So how are you putting all of these things supposedly in the law? But there's nothing in the law about head coverings on anybody. Oh, wow. You know, I used to go visit the temple and I was going to put the kippa on, right? But before I put the kippa on, I wanted to ask somebody what it meant. I wasn't going to put it on if it wasn't straight. They didn't have an answer. You do this every week. Every time you come in, you put the kippa on. But you don't have an answer for why. You know, I asked four people. I never did get a real answer. Huh. Wow. Three rabbis, no less, didn't get a real answer. I understand what this is. We kippa. I asked for rabbis. I couldn't get an answer on it. So I just didn't do it. I will ask after service. So don't follow stuff you get online. Old wives' tales and Jewish myths have run through this place and others. And people want to malign me and Kelly because we refuse to follow. We weren't appointed to peddle this junk. We were appointed to give you the truth, straight, clean. And we'll even hold up under duress. Amen? We've been through a lot of duress through the years. People are not want more than Luke 11. We're just not going to bend on the truth. Because if you want your God encounter to be real, and you want to be able to rely on what you get in the Spirit, you've got to be grounded in the truth. You can't do it any other way. Luke 11, verse 23. <clears throat> he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. So when we're all alike speaking the truth in love, then we can discern who God is calling, and we can nurture them with God's precious truth. God calls, we don't. However, when he calls, we have to give account to him for the work that we do with those who are called. But you get people that come that aren't called, and you get people that come that are called. And how are you going to discern if you don't know the truth? And sometimes the people that come in who are called are caught up in some of these things. And how do you gently work it out of them? Amen? What is your testimony about Hungry Hearts Ministries? Does your witness make people want to join or run away? I grew up in the Worldwide Church of God in Orlando, Florida. We had a weekly attendance of 450 people. And that wasn't a big church. Atlanta had four that were over 600. Chicago, I don't even remember how many in Chicago. I mean, Chicago, you talk about a brother from Chicago. I mean, they, 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 they'd be rattled off with a church. Over, they, they were using names, all the little place names up in Chicago with a church over there and a church over here and a church over there. I mean, all kinds of churches in Chicago. Rock is a big city. Amen. Well, when Lisa and I came in, we would get six to ten new people a day. Every Sabbath, we'd get six to ten new people. And I know because I was one of the ones that the elders would come to and say, Hey, Billy, this is so-and-so. They just came in. It's their first day. Would you take them around and introduce them to some people? So, you know, I would, I would watch them come in because I was one of the ones taking them and introducing them around. We had lots of people coming in. We had a big TV show, and our magazine was eight and a half million magazines a month. <clears throat> so that's a work getting out there. We were getting results. Of course, being in Central Florida doesn't hurt, right? When we moved to Jackson, Tennessee, in late August of, of 20, I mean, 1999, 91, 
there was 175 brothers in the Jackson, Tennessee congregation. 175. And it was, it was a satellite of Memphis, and we weren't even really big enough for them to give us our own ministry. They just sent the pastor from Memphis up once in a while. We weren't big enough. But y'all get this in a minute. Now, out of that congregation, I know of less than 150 who were still observant. Less than 150. That's a lot of people going. And, and, and let me tell you something about that. Before we left, the combined Daytona Orlando church was almost 800 people. Amen? So out of that universe, there's less than 150. Now they meet in Deltona. There's not enough in Orlando anymore, and there's not enough in Daytona anymore, so they split the difference in Deltona, and they both come to Deltona to meet. And I have been there to visit with my with all our friends from the past. There's less than 150 of them. I only know of two others who were spirit-filled. Wow. None of the people I know are teaching how to have a face-to-face -face encounter with the living Yeshua inside. We're in. See how that comes down as you filter as you keep adding the filters to get where God wants us to be. See, a lot of people are willing to go so far with God and that's it. And some people will go a little farther with God, but that's it. And when it comes to all the way with God, no, nah, that's a little too much God for me. Exodus 34. How much God do you want? See, Torah observing is great life. If that's all there was, it'd be worth doing it. If, if, uh, if, if that's all there was, it would be a great life. It is well worth doing just, just for that alone. But there's a whole lot more that God has for us than Torah observance. Torah observance, like I said in the beginning of the message, gets you in the race, but it's not the race itself. It's what gets you in the story, but it's not where the story's going. Without Torah observance, everything else I'm going to say is useless because you're not getting there from here. you got to live this if you want more. Amen? And we teach on Holy Ghost baptism. I'm not going to touch that today. Uh, Exodus 34, verse 4. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. And then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, yod heh vav -Heh. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, yod heh vav -Heh, yod heh vav -Heh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not lead the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. This is the second book of the Bible. I want you to look at how, how very little Bible we're into at this point. This is the second book. Look how, much, look how much Bible is behind where this is and look how much Bible is in front of where this is, right? We've gone nowhere in this book and we have this encounter. That's tremendous. We've gone nowhere in this book and we have this encounter. Face to face. Moses did not get this because he kept Torah. If he didn't keep Torah, he wouldn't even be here to be having the conversation, right? He didn't get this because of Torah, but he couldn't have it without Torah. Do you follow what I'm saying? Torah is not enough to get this, but without Torah, you're not getting this far. Without Torah, you're still back at Exodus 19. With Torah, you can get to here, but it takes more. It takes more. Moses got the encounter of a lifetime for several reasons. First of all, God could trust him. Amen. Moses had demonstrated to God that he was trustworthy. Hebrews chapter 3. He had demonstrated to God that he was trustworthy. And you know, it's, it's as much for Moses' protection and your protection. Because if you do stupid things with God you ain't going to be here to talk about it. And I don't just mean here. I mean permanent in the lake of fire gone. So for our protection, we have to be trustworthy. For our protection, we have to be Torah observant. You're playing with the real deity. This is not the fake deities. This is not all the, the metaphorical stuff. This is the real creator God. you got to have the level of reverence and deference and respect and awe and wonder and obedience. 
because when he tells you to go down to the store and buy something, you better you better be on the way already. I'm not making that up. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 5. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house. No matter what God told Moses, it was as good as done. Amen? Didn't matter how many cores had to go in the hole. That let him go forward with God. Exodus chapter 24. He was faithful. So he could go forward. If you're faithful, you can go forward. Hungry Hearts is going to be faithful. Hungry Hearts is going forward. The only question that is left to be answered is whether you're going with us or not. Amen? Hey, you going with us? Welcome you aboard. But you got to be faithful. you got to be faithful. Because we're going to go places that you can't go if you're not faithful. Amen? Exodus 24, verse 3. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws. Okay, now, you see where you are in Exodus 24. So Exodus 23, Exodus 22, Exodus 21, Exodus 20. The book of the law. The, all of this is what's being talked about. These four chapters right here, right? The, these four chapters right here. This is what we're talking about. They all responded with one voice. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. Okay, you don't realize this, but when you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you said the same thing. All the eternal has said, I'll do it. There it is. You agree? You agree? Are you doing it? Because see, you told him you'd do it. And if you're not doing it now, you're unfaithful and you're not trustworthy. Oh, pastor, you keep going there. Yeah, keep going there. I'm going to keep on going there. Because this is the how you get in the door. Right. Immediate obedience. No wavering. Just do it. Just do it. Remember the old Nike ads? Just do it. If he said it, just do it. What's it? There's no argument. The deity who put breath in you. You know, they can explain everything. They can explain all kinds of stuff. But the one thing that no evolutionist can explain, the one thing no atheist can explain is, how does the life get in the cell? Oh, they'll answer the what about the life in the cell, but that's not the question that's asked. The question is, how does life get in a cell? And when has anybody ever put life in a cell any other time? Oh, oh, I guess there's a deity after all, amen? So when the deity's telling you to do something, then they'll say, oh, somebody did something really stupid. They must have been talking to God. No. Crazy, crazy people aren't talking to God. They're talking to devils. God doesn't tell you to go out and do something stupid and crazy. He's brilliant. It's devils that tell you to go out and do stupid and crazy stuff. God tells you to go out and do brilliant stuff. There's no help for some of those people. No way we just do it. Moses was hungry for God. First Samuel. Thank Kelly Mack, breakfast sister and feast. Samuel 1 and verse 10. At least got this word of prayer meeting so many years ago. 1 Samuel 1 verse 10. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and cried out to the Lord. Hungry love. This is Hannah's hungry love. This is the hungry love that could not be denied. But look here. If you're not keeping Torah, you're not getting in here. She's at the tent of meeting. We saw an archaeological film that showed the stone wall around where the tent enclosure was. You didn't even get into stone wall if you're not Torah observant. You're not getting to the tent. You're outside the camp. You're unclean. You're not getting in. So she's Torah observant. She's there. She's at the tent. She's crying out to the Lord because she has a personal crisis and she is in need. And the Lord was right there. Hunger that would not be denied. Exodus 33. Hunger that would not be denied. And see, if she wasn't poor observant, it wouldn't have mattered how hungry she was. Amen? Would not be denied. Are you hungry? So you got to be hungry for God. Because some people, you know, when it comes to the presence of God, no, I could eat. You're not good enough. I could eat means you're going home. you got to clap happy. That's it. I could eat means, yeah, you felt a little brrr in, the, in the deep part of the worship, but it wasn't too bad. We brush it off. It's like it wasn't there. Maybe I'm sleeping. But when you're hungry for Jesus, 
you coming out of here with experience. Amen. 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 You're tour observing, you're spirit filled, and you're hungry. I'm try starving to death for Jesus. So you got to learn how to tap into starving to death about Friday afternoon. Yeah. Well, I've had enough of this world. I'm sick of them. They're pulling out in traffic. They're stopping in the middle of the road. They, they're playing the phone. They're honking back when you honk to get this to get them to move because they stopped in the middle of the road, blocking up traffic for two miles. I, I'm sick of this world. I want some Jesus, man. I'm hungry. I need Jesus. I need the presence of God because I can't take these people no more. That's what you got to kick in about three o'clock. That's it. Can't take it no more. <laughs> You start learning how to kick that in on Friday afternoon. You'll start having some salmon. Exodus 33, verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, leave these people. But you have not let me know whom you're going to send. See, he's still talking angels. Who, who are you going to send? You'll send Michael? How about Gabriel? You'll send me Gabriel? Gabriel will lead us to you. You've said, I know you by name and you found favor with me. Right? That's what God has said to Moses. You know me by name and I found favor. He goes, now, if I have found favor... If you're pleased with me, teach me your ways. The evangelist Mac has been teaching us on the ways, right? Months now. The ways. The ways so you can know him. Right. It takes more than the ways, but if you're not living the ways, you're not getting in. So without the ways, you're not getting in, but you got to have the ways and then you got to have the hunger. Amen? you got to live the ways and you got to have the hunger. you got to follow all those little nitpicky rules in Torah. They're not there just because God wanted to hear himself talk. They're there to show you how to keep your flesh in line so that you can believe what you get in the Spirit. Right. How many times have you known somebody get something in the Spirit and it was no good? Right. They're not keeping these rules. You can't trust it. So I may know you will continue to find favor. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you. Okay, we're not calling angels anymore. I know the writer of Hebrews talks about angels mediating the covenant, but we're not talking about angels anymore because he says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. <clears throat> then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go, don't even send us up. I don't even want to go. We'll sit out here in the desert. I got the cloud over the, the, the tent. You, you coming to meet with me in the tent of meeting? We'll just stay right here. Don't send me out of this place if you're not going with me because I don't want your presence here. Somebody get that? When the cloud lifts up, you follow the cloud. When the cloud settles down, you stay where the cloud is. You follow the cloud. You stay where the cloud of God's presence is. If he gets up and goes, we all get up and go. See, too many people come to Hungry Hearts and they want to go when the cloud is still sitting there and they want to stay when the cloud is gone. you got to follow the cloud. The cloud of God's visitation is where we're going. Where are we going? I don't know. Does it matter? Did Abraham know? God just didn't get up and go. He said, where am I going? Abraham didn't say, where am I going? God just said, I'll show you when you get there. Did Abraham say, I need to know where I'm going. I can't put it in my garment until you tell me where it is. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say that. His camel didn't have a garment. He had, he had God's position system. He didn't have to have no garment. He didn't have to have his smartphone to tell him where to go. Just follow where God said to go. Your phone is going to take you to the wrong place. How many times did it already take you to the wrong place? How many times you been lost on that phone? How many times your Garmin not been trustworthy? I was driving on 840 one time. The Garmin was freaking out because it didn't recognize 840. Every crossroad, turn, turn, turn. It's showing the car going through the woods. It was, I had to unplug it. I couldn't. At first it was funny. <laughs> this smart Garmin is so stupid. <laughs> After a while, I said, unplug that thing. That's getting on my nerves. Turn here, turn here, turn here, turn here, turn here. It's trying to root me all the way back to Nashville to get back on the 40 and come on. Oh, please. I'm almost a Dixon, man. <laughs> it wasn't happy till I got on Interstate 40 again. But even, even the exit before I got off on Interstate 40 is telling me to turn around and go back. I don't want to turn around and go back to Nashville. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? The only thing that distinguishes hungry hearts from everybody else is the presence of God. Yeah. It's the only thing that will ever distinguish us. We may have the greatest learning. We may have the greatest doctrines. We may have the greatest move in the spirit. We may have all kinds of stuff. But it's this right here that makes all the difference in the world. The very presence of Jesus, the living, resurrected Messiah in our midst. This is everything. 
And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you and know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. So he's hungry. He keeps pushing in. Every time the Lord says, okay, he pushes in a little more. Okay, he pushes in a little more. Okay, he pushes in a little more. Why? Because he's hungry. Amen. He can't get enough. And that's the whole secret of the presence of God is a little bit will make you starving to death for more. And more will make you starving to death for even more. And more will make you just ravenous. I can't have enough. And you get crazy for God. I love it when that happens. Amen. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. Then the Lord said, <clears throat> there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock, and when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until you I pass by. Then I will remove my hand and you can see my back, but my face must not be seen. Nonsense. Flip over to Matthew 17. Because what God did was he put him in the cleft of the rock and he put his hand over him and when he uncovered his hand, Moses was several thousand years in the future because Moses asked to see his glory. Well, come on, somebody. Amen. So Moses gets to see it. Matthew 17, verse 1. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led him up on a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before him, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. And just there, then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Show me your glory. There he is. There he is. So we got to see it. Because he kept pressing in. Mm -hmm. We keep pressing in, we're going to get to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. We keep pressing in, we're going to get to see it. You clean up your life. You get stuff ready. You show them your work been approved by you studying the word and getting into all the stuff and learning the doctrines. And you press in by giving some people. I got it very at the very beginning of this search back in 2001. If we want Jesus' presence, we got to do his work. He's into his work. Amen. His work means more to him than anything else. If we're doing his work and we're seeking him and we're living right and we're getting our stuff together, then he's going to show up. He's going to not only show up, he's going to tend to everything in your life. Look, we're going to get on this cleanliness thing in a couple weeks. You want Jesus in the house? It's got to be clean. You've got to follow the priestly rules for cleanliness because that kind of stuff makes him go, oh, that's nasty, I'm out of here. You don't want him going to that, doing that. You want him showing up hanging out, sitting with you with coffee. Yeah. Nothing like coffee with the Lord in the morning. I, there's nothing like that. Coffee with the Lord in the morning. Right. When God means more to you than your private agendas, when God means more to you than life, when God's agenda becomes your agenda, when you've completely surrendered, then you're ready for Hamakon and to have that experience in that place. How to have a great year. Use the test you buy plan to boost your life into God's presence. First, we have to build the foundation of God-fearing toward observance, and then we can fuel our life with Holy Ghost baptism. And after we're fueled up, then we're ready to use this simple program to evangelize our communities. And with the hunger that comes from evangelizing, we get to seek the very face of the living God. That will make a good year, amen? Yeah.